Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. I am so incredibly excited to bring this word to you. I do not say this lightly. This is one of the most important messages that I have probably ever delivered. This message is something that affects every single person, every single day, from every single walk of life. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, rich, poor, black, yellow, red, white, brown, doesn't matter. Everybody's affected by it. Even Jesus was affected by it. So listen in. I believe that in this pivotal message, God's going to stir something in your heart and give you a way out. He always gives you a way out. Did you know that? God always gives you a way out. So listen in to this very special, enlightening, oh, thrilling message that God laid on my heart. Oops, I did it again. Overcoming temptation. Uh, bride and groom are getting married. The bride's sister, the maid of honor, invites the groom over to her house and says, will you help me kind of write up a speech for what I'm going to say at the reception? And the groom goes over and the bride's sister answers the door. And she's dressed rather seductively. More like this. <laughs> or some of you men in the 70s, amen. Hey some of you men in the 70s. You came. I was alone, I should have known you were temptation. Perry Como saying that, I don't think Perry Como was ever tempted by anything in his life, maybe peanut butter or something. But she takes him to sit down in a chair and she asks for his help and everything that she said, oh, she, she said, oh, you're just so amazing and so knowledgeable. I mean, she poured it on and just flirt and flirt and flirt. Well, he was very, really very quite surprised. And, and, and she'd come over and ask him questions and bend down lowly in front of him and asking all sorts of things. And you can only imagine and about her speech. And finally, when they're all finished, she said, look, she said, uh, I'm going to go upstairs now and I'd like you to follow me. She goes up the stairs and the groom sits there for a minute. He stands up and he walks to the front door and he opens it. And right there is his bride-to-be and her family. And they've got balloons, and they start cheering. Yes, 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 yes. They said it was all a test. It was all a test to see if you would give in, to see if you would be faithful, to see if you were really committed, to see if you were really all into this marriage and this relationship. It was a test, and you passed the test. Yay! And they all run into the house. They go, come on, let's celebrate. And they run into the house to celebrate, and the groom turns around to go back in the house, and he says under his breath, thank God I left my gum in the car. <laughs> I don't know if I could tell that joke this morning, but you're such a carnal bunch, I figured I could get away with it. <laughs> Oops, Lord! I did it again. Oops, God, I messed up again. Oops, Lord, I sinned again. Oops! Who's ever said that? Who's tired of oopsing? Huh? Please be real today. Please don't play church today. You, you don't have to play church at this church. At this church, there are no perfect people. We mess up, we make mistakes, we even sin. In fact, I'm going to tell you something that might scare you out of your chair. You ready? The person sitting next to you sinned yesterday. <laughs> and quite possibly this morning. We're not here because we're perfect. In fact, none of us here are trying to be perfect. We're here because we found a God that loves us totally and completely despite our imperfections. And guess what? The God I serve doesn't even expect perfection from me. And every time I sin, guess what this amazing God does? He forgives me. Amen. Then why do I even bother trying to be like Jesus? Because I see in him the most beautiful way to be. Yeah. Friends, when I look at Jesus, I see my potential. You can bring me down just a hair. I see my future potential in Jesus in ways that I don't see it when I look at anybody else. I see how I can live. I see how I can love. I see how I can forgive. I see how I can be gracious. I see how I can sacrifice. Jesus gives me not some shaming bar that I can never reach. That's how some people look at God. No, Jesus gives me a standard that I can, I can rise to. My friends, you and I were made to rise. Let, let me preach a whole sermon on that, can I? You and I were made to rise above our sinful nature and rise above who we were yesterday, and rise above our limitations, and rise above our flesh, and rise above our circumstances. I mean, 
the whole movement of Christianity began with seven words. Here they are. It says, he is not here, he has risen. Living for Jesus is all about rising. When, when people come looking for you who knew you before you knew Jesus, their entire testimony should be this. He is not here, he is risen. She is not here, she has risen. Oh, who, who Bob was is not here, he has risen. Who Esperanza is is not here, she has risen. Don't expect to find the old me when you find me, I've risen. Don't expect to find the me from five years ago, me, I've risen. Don't expect to find the me from one year ago, I've risen. When you meet Matt Chick, don't expect to meet the Matt Chick from one hour ago, he's not here. Matt has risen, amen? Woo, I've risen. Don't expect me find to be where I used to be doing what I used to do because I've risen. I'm not perfect. I'm not done. I'm like bread dough. The yeast is still working. I'm still rising, but I'm not who I used to be. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm not who I used to be. Thank God. Maybe you are, but just hold on. Church God, church God always takes you to something better. Never lesser. God's not in the business of diminishing you. He's in the business of increasing you. He doesn't want to divide you. He wants to multiply you. He doesn't want to subtract from you. He wants to add on to you. He's the God who will take you from faith to faith and glory to glory. Doesn't mean you won't have tribulations. Doesn't mean you won't be persecuted. Doesn't mean that you won't have fears and devils and distractions. What I'm talking about is what God is doing on the inside. Even when it feels like I'm decreasing, God is using it to increase me. Even when it looks like things are going down because of his power, things are going up. Amen? When you stick with God, your life is going to rise. Turn to somebody and say, my life is on the rise. My life is on the rise. Oh, man. Can I preach today? Your spiritual life should always be rising. And yet, even as I rise, I still find myself saying from time to time, oops, I did it again. Here's the simple truth, not to shame you, not to guilt you, it's just an inescapable fact of life in the flesh. You and I blow it from time to time. The Christian life is a guilt-free life, but it's not a mistake-free life. The Bible never hides its truth. The Bible is painfully honest about the failures of the Bible's greatest heroes. God saved the whole world after a flood through a man named Noah, who then got drunk and naked and he blew it off. Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea and into freedom, yet his anger kept him out of the promised land. He blew it. The Bible tells the story of King David, a man after God's own heart, who then had an affair and arranged the murder of the woman's husband so he wouldn't be discovered. Look, if God only used perfect people, the Bible would be a pretty short book. Here's the story of Jesus with nobody else. But we serve a God who realizes recognizes our frailty. In fact, he has a solution for our failures. It's called grace. Amen. The Bible says, Galatians 2 and 14, God canceled the debt which, he li which listed all the rules we failed to follow, and he took away that record with its rules, and he nailed it to the cross. I told you, I'm going to give you a little bit of a master class. God canceled our sin debt. We don't have to pay the bill for our sins. Jesus paid the bill. The clear picture in the Bible is this. You and I have a God who turns failures into triumphs. We live for our God who can transform our broken lives. Today, I, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, several things. I'm going to talk to you about three things, really. I'm going to talk to you about temptation, sin, and overcoming it. Because yes, you can overcome. Say, yes, I can. But this morning, this morning, I want to peel back the blinds from temptation. I want to tear away the facade, and I want to show you what temptation is and what temptation is not. Number one, you're, you're going to be shocked here. Temptations are not sinful or anything to be ashamed of. One of the worst lies about temptation is that being tempted is a sin. I want to address this first because often when we are tempted, we don't even stop on the path to sin because we think we've already blown it just because we were just tempted. We think temptation and sin are the same thing, and they're not. Turn to somebody and say, they're not. If I go to a restaurant and they bring the dessert menu, guess what? There's a big difference between wanting every dessert on the menu and me actually ordering them and eating them. Only one of those things will actually hurt me, the actual eating of the dessert. One time in my whole life, many years ago, Ashley and I went out. We ordered every dessert on the menu. Bring me one of everything. And guess what? It hurt. It felt like a glorious hurt, but boy, I, I was sick. One of the reasons nobody ever talks about their temptations is because they assume that temptations must be sinful. But temptations are not a sin. 
Hebrews 4, 5 says this, we do not have a high priest Jesus who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all ways. What's it say? He was, Jesus was tempted as we are yet without what? Sin. Jesus was tempted in all the ways that you and I are tempted. It says, but he never sinned. But he never sinned. That means temptations cannot be a sin or anything to be ashamed of. Temptations are as normal as living and breathing. Number two, look at this. Temptations come to everybody, no matter how godly they are. Yes, even Floyd. I know it's going to be a shock to you. People assume that the more godly a person becomes, the less temptations that person will face. Yet the most godly person to ever walk the earth was... No, not Floyd. Jesus. And it says, look at this, let's look at it again, throw it up there. Jesus was in every way, in all ways, in everything, in every way that we're tempted, he was tempted like we are tempted. Jesus wasn't tempted, uh, tempted, tempted, tempted a little or in certain categories, he was tempted in all ways. Every thought that you've ever had in your life that you were tempted, Jesus has thought that thought. It may have not about, about the exact same thing, but he had the same exact temptation that God put in front of him about something else. Jesus wasn't just tempted a little, but always. And then, and then uh, one, two, and then let me give you number three here. Number three is this. Temptations surround you the most when you are the closest to your purpose. Listen to this. I was telling a young couple recently, they're getting married, and I said, I, I told them I recommend a short engagement. You know why? Because the engagement period is often the hardest time in the life of a couple. Every insecurity comes out, every worry comes out. Is this the one? Is he my soulmate? Is she my soulmate? Is this the person I want to grow old with? Is this the person I have to have sex with the rest of my life? Is there nobody else? What's happening? What's happening is you're getting closer to your purpose, which is to get married. And so temptation hits you all over the place. They found the couples, men and women, two thirds of them, two thirds of them cheat in some way on their fiance at their bachelor or bachelorette party. The world says, well, that's okay. The world says, that's good. Your, your bachelor brother, buddies tell you what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Look, if you can't be committed to me 18 hours before we walk down the line to get committed for the rest of our lives, then please leave, get out the door. Amen? Amen? Temptation is the strongest when you're the closest to your purpose in your relationships, in your job, in your dreams, in your church, in your ministry. Adam and Eve messed up right when they were right in the middle of God's purpose for their lives. But Rowdy, what about people who are tempted and they are not fulfilling any sort of purpose in their life? That's usually, it's not that they're even tempted, it's just that they're bored. Listen now, how many times have you done the wrong thing and you didn't even want to, you were just bored? Hello? Huh? You weren't even tempted, you were just bored. Come on. Come on, you bunch of liars. You're just bored. Come on, ladies. You love, you love purses and you didn't even feel like buying a purse. But you were bored. It wasn't temptation, it was boredom. Okay, 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 okay. And we're going to talk about that too anyway. The strong, well, someday. The strongest temptations you will feel in life will come when you are either living in your purpose or you are getting really, really close to it. Don't forget this. Let's, let's look at two close people who were tempted. Jesus and Judas. Jesus was tempted to quit and Judas was tempted to quit and sell Jesus out. And it all happened right before both of them were closest to the ultimate purposes of their life being fulfilled. Friends, when you get close to your purpose, oh, you better wake up to this one. You better wake up. When you get close to your purpose, temptations will arise all over the place. Devil will just start launching stuff. Launching it. Like at the, at the arena when they shoot the t-shirts out. Devil will just, uh, just launch it all over the place. Wow, what's happening? The devil is trying to divert you from what God has for you to do. The devil tempts us to distract us and get our focus off of God's purpose for our lives. The devil's not, you heard Matt say it, but the devil's not worried about you believing in God. He's worried about you serving God. Right. It's the same thing he did to Eve. The devil tempted Eve. He distracted her. He appealed to her eyes, to her flesh, and to her pride. When Jesus was getting ready to step into his purpose, to step into his ministry, what's the first thing that happened? The devil tempted him three times. Jesus had to get through those three temptations to get to his ministry, and the same thing happens to us. If you've ever lost your focus of what you're supposed to be doing because temptation distracted you, you know what I'm talking about. And let me pull back the blinds even further. Let me say this, number four, temptations are normal God-given desires that seek to trespass God's boundaries. That's what my wife's book's all about. What are temptations? Temptation is simply a good desire gone bad. 
there's nothing wrong with me being tempted to kiss my wife. In fact, I'm tempted to go kiss her right now. <laughs> that is a good temptation. It's a wrong temptation if I want to kiss somebody at the grocery store. God put desire into each of us, not so, not so we would desire the wrong things, but so we had the capacity to desire the right things. But the devil knows how to work our desire meter. The Bible says that he roams the earth seeking out those whom he can devour. Remember, the devil always offers an evil opposite for what God created. Every single temptation is rooted in a normal desire. Our God-given desires, look at this. Our God-given desires, temptations go wrong when we seek to fulfill them in the wrong things, the wrong places, or with the wrong person. What about gluttony? That's definitely not a normal desire, right? Well, how about if I can't get enough of God? How, how about if I can't get enough of reading the Bible? Or enough of loving my wife? Or enough of caring for my kids? What about, what if I'm addicted to Jesus? By the way, I'm addicted to Jesus. It's a, yeah, right, right? And, 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 and like Mark, what are you, Mark? You're a what? You're a dopeless hope dealer. Thank you, Mark. I said it for you. It's a healthy addiction. The problem comes when my desires, the problem comes when my desires or temptations take me to the wrong things, the wrong place, or the wrong person. In other words, it's okay to be tempted. It's just about the focus of your temptation. The focus of your temptation is the problem. And your temptation, your focus needs to be on God. Imagine if we were more tempted about God. Temptations are God-given desires. What you and I do with our desires determines if we walk in obedience or in disobedience. So, so, so tell me what to do. I'm glad you asked. Let me, let's start here. Let me, let me tell you something everybody says to me. They say, but Rowdy, I just seem to have a bigger problem with temptation than everybody else. Temptation just seems to affect me more. Temptation is just stronger in my life. I hear it all the time. I, I get it. You think you've got a bigger problem than everybody else has a problem. So let me show you a very important scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. This is the, the, the scripture that everybody's perverted and said, God won't send you more than you can bear. He's only, we're only talking about temptation. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you will be able to endure it. Now watch this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. First of all, and this is your master class, what that means is, is that none of us is alone in being tempted. And number two, whatever you're being tempted by is not unique to you. It is common to everyone. One of the things that temptation does to grab us is to shame us that you are the only person in the world who's dealing with this. You are the only person sitting there in your church, sitting with all these godly people around you. <laughs> sitting with all these pure never have a bad thought I want to kill that guy with my car nobody here ever feels that way I'll bet never never look at all these God I can hardly worship around all these godly pure people no 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 temptation tries to grab you by saying you are alone in this you're the only one dealing with this but the Bible says that the temptations in your life are no different from what any else experiences. What about the pastor? Yeah. Don't let temptation shame you into a corner like you're the only person who deals with it. Because I'll tell you what that does. It gives that temptation a grip on you. In fact, the scripture that says no temptation has overtaken you, overtaken, look at this, this is beautiful, overtaken comes from the Greek word lambano, everybody say lambano, and it means get possession of and seize you. No temptation has seized you. This is literally what temptation does. You can be going about your normal day. This is, this is so perfect. God, God said everything. This is, how, this is how you know that God wrote this. This is literally what temptation does. You can be going about your normal day and suddenly a person or a place or a thing distracts you and literally it seizes your attention. Hello? Hello? Huh? Guys, you were just trying to find the game on ESPN. Not a thought in the world about a woman. Not a thought in the world about sex. 
not a lustful twinge in your body. I know all you women are shocked. Men think about sex all the time. No, it's just that at any time something can make us think about sex, all right? So, and on the way to ESPN, you flip past Lifetime, and it says, sexy wives who killed their husbands. Bam! Temptation seizes you. That might be the stupidest title in history. But what's the first thing you think about? Sexy wives. I just want to see what they did to their husband. <laughs> Poor guy. I'm not even going to watch. When she comes on the screen, I'm not even going to watch her. I'm just going to see what happened to that poor guy. Oh, you man. Come on. I'm reading your diaries right now. <laughs> Nobody's thinking about the husband who died right now. You men are wondering, is there really a show like that? <laughs> you women are like, that's disgusting. But you ladies were flipping through the channels to watch The Last Chef, and you went past Hallmark, and, and it says, A Boyfriend for Christmas, starring Dean Cain. <laughs> On Christmas Day, Santa brings two lonely people together, but can love overcome deception. Which, by the way, is a real movie. Oh, Dean Cain, he's so cute. He's Superman. I'm just going to watch him because he's cute. I mean, there's nothing sexual about it. He's just a cute guy, right? <laughs> Oh, lifetime. It's just cute. You know what happened? It seized you. That's exactly what temptation does. It just kind of seizes you. And the first thing you need to know is that temptation is after you. You know why? Because temptation wants to grab a hold of you so you don't get to God's amazing purpose. The first way out of temptation. Here we go. The first way out of temptation. Who wants to get out of temptation? Who wants to get off temptation island? Don't ever watch those disgusting shows, by the way. And we'll get to that. Number one, here it is. Know that God, say it with me. Know that God is faithful. When you are feeling tempted and you want to overcome it, know that God is faithful and he is right there beside you and in you and around you to help you through it. God doesn't run off because you're tempted. Oh no, here they go. No, he is a very present help in times of trouble. God is right there with all of his power and his might ready to help you overcome. And you need to stop and recognize that God is there and ready to assist you. And you need to call out to him and say, and don't just fall into temptation, but know that remember God is faithful and call out, God, I need your help with this. You need to get on where you, maybe you got to fall on your knees right where you are, right there, right there in the middle of, of savers. Amen. God, I need you to get me through this. I know that you are right here with me and God, I need you right now. I don't care how big or how small the temptation is. In fact, don't make the mistake of thinking it's small. Small temptations turn into giant sins. Sometimes the devil will just send you a, a teeny tiny simple looking little thing, a little glimpse from your roof of Bathsheba, and bam, it seizes you, big or small. Stop and pray. Stop and pray. Come on, people. You've got to start praying when you get tempted. Call on God's faithfulness. God, help me right now to overcome this temptation. In Jesus' greatest times of temptation, he prayed. It's what got him through. And he even sweat great drops of blood. And Jesus said, Matthew 26, 41, he said, keep alert and pray. Otherwise, temptation will overpower, will overpower you. You might have got to pray for a minute. You might have to pray for 10 minutes. You might have to pray till you sweat great drops of blood. But for God's sake, pray and trust in God's faithfulness. You might have got to keep on praying through the day and all through the night and tomorrow and the next day. Amen? Psalm 50, 15 says this. It says, call to me when trouble comes and I will save you. God promises to save you. God promises mercy and grace to help us when, when we need it. But, but you need to be in relationship with God. A working, growing, thriving relationship. In fact, if they did a study, a poll about temptation. And 81% of people said temptation was harder when they had neglected to spend time with God. When they weren't going to church and praying and read the Bible and fellowship. And God is faithful. But for this thing to work, we have to be faithful too. Number two thing you need to know to overcome temptation. Number two, here it is. God will never let you be tempted by more than you can stand. Oh, master class. Here it is. This is really big. Don't buy into the lie that your temptation is just too strong. 
Those are heavenly bells. Whenever that bells go off, that means I'm delivering a word from the Holy Spirit directly to your heart. Yeah? Don't buy into the lie that your temptation is just too strong. No. God says your temptation is never stronger than you are in Jesus. Never. I don't care how big and scary and wild it is. I don't care how addicted you are to it. God says your addiction is never bigger than you and him. The scripture says, 1 Corinthians 13, 10, let's see it again. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Did, did, oh, here's master class. Did you know your temptations are always limited in their power by God himself? Imagine that. The devil knows what tempts you. And he fills up his fishing hook full of whatever he knows that you find most tempting and he casts it into the lake of your life. But watch this. It doesn't matter if what you're tempted by is sex, drugs, fear, worry, jealousy, doubt, anything else. God says he has power. He has limited its power. And through Jesus, he has made you more powerful than your temptation. You're in charge. Not your temptation. You don't have to bite. Get away from the hook. Amen. If we were all swimming together, we're all a bunch of fish, I'd be yelling at you, get away from the hook, amen? amen. Romans 6.14 is this, bunch of dumb fish that we are, right? It says, <laughs> sin is no longer your master. Hello, somebody. For you no longer live under the law, but you live under God's grace. Sin is not the master of your life. Jesus is. And because Jesus lives in you, sin does not rule over you. You rule over your sin. Romans 6.11 says this, go to the next one. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. When the temptation of sin comes, don't cower in fear. Don't give in to it like it's your master. You need to capture that thought and stand up to it and say, In Jesus' name, I am dead to your power. I am dead to your rule. I am dead to every bit of influence you had over my life. I'm alive in Jesus Christ and he is my master. He is my ruler. He is my influence, not sin. Amen? Romans 6.12 says this. Don't let sin control your body and the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. When, when you fall into temptation's trap, what you are saying is that you are not grateful for what God has already given you in your life. Through Jesus, don't give in. You got to get on your knees and be thankful. God, thank you. Thank you for what I already have and who I already have. Through Jesus, do not give in. I'm so thankful. For, I could never have an affair on my wife, not only because I'm too tired to have an affair, amen? But look, be, but because I am so thankful for my wife. She is, I, I, told, I tell my wife all the time, I said, I, I hope you don't mind, but you are, the, you are the object of all of my affection and my lust and my desire. It's all good, amen? It's all good stuff. And my wife says that I'm hers. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? <laughs> yes, yes. She, she, my wife, she, she is romantic and she seduces me. And I am the object of her affection and she is the object of mine. And the other day she whispered something in my ear. And, oh my goodness. And, and the, kids, the kids said, oh my goodness, stop it, you guys. And I said, mom was just whispering sweet nothings. And I said, actually, it wasn't nothing. It was something. It was wonderful. <laughs> Look at My friends, through Jesus... Don't give in to your temptation. Give in to thankfulness. You have too much purpose in your life. And sin is trying to make you feel helpless, but you're not. This needs to be our daily attitude because we are tempted on all sides. I, 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 I saw a just an incredible story the other day that, 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 that zoos hire men who go off to other countries to capture animals, to, to, to bring them back. Uh, uh, to, to America to go in the zoos, the, the healthy ones, not the ones who are sneaking them in and doing it illegally. But these guys who go out and capture them will tell you that the hardest, the very hardest uh, animal to catch is a ring-tailed monkey. <laughs> ring-tailed monkey, hardest animal to catch. They said they're so fast, but the Zulus have no trouble catching them. In Africa, no problem at all. You know why? Because the Zulus take a melon. They know that a ring-tailed monkey's favorite fruit is the melon. Listen to this. And so they cut a tiny hole in the melon, just the size, no bigger than the size of that little ring-tailed monkey's hand, that the ring-tailed monkey's hand can fit in. So the ring-tailed monkey reaches his hand in and he grabs the clumps of seeds. Now listen, the ring-tailed monkey loves the melon so much that he will not 
he can't pull his hand out, right? It's full of seeds. But he will not release the seeds to pull his hand out. And they can just walk right up to them and pick them up to catch them. No problem. You're all laughing. <laughs> you got your hand in a melon. Let go. Let go of what's in there. And pull your hand out. Amen? It can be very difficult to rein in your temptations. But the good news is the one who lives in you was once in your shoes or sandals. And he understands what it feels like. And not only does he understand it, but he has compassion for you when you're tempted. Jesus doesn't look at you and go, oh, oops, they did it again. You know, <laughs> Jesus has been where you are and felt what you feel. And he has overcome the temptations you are now trying to overcome. So there is no need to feel too embarrassed to go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. If anybody understands, it's Jesus. And he's like, okay, yeah, I've been there. I know exactly what you're feeling. He understands your dilemma, your problem, your frustration. He understands all of it. But more than that, he knows how to get you through it and out of it because he got through it himself. Don't be ashamed. Take your temptation to Jesus, friends. Jesus, help me. Number three. Oh, big, big, big. Don't dwell on what is tempting you. What, what? Huh? Don't spend so much time obsessing over what is tempting you. Because if that's all you're thinking about, guess what? You're going to fall right. Mm. The longer temptation grabs a hold of you, guess what happens? The longer it has to turn into sin. Temptation is not sin, right? But guess what? If you dwell on it, it will turn into sin. Martin Luther said this. You cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Yeah? So that's something Xavier would say. This is where God comes in. Because God promises to make a way of what? Oh, of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. Here it is. I'm going to show it again. But when you are tempted, God will also provide an escape so that you will be able to endure it. Friends, when you are tempted, don't let it seize you. Start looking for a way out. How do I get out of this? There is nothing, and I'm going to say this. Every time I speak about temptation, I make this statement. There is nothing you've ever been tempted by where there was not a way out of it. Hello? You're thinking right now. Go ahead. Let me give you 10 minutes. Go ahead. God always makes a way out. Whether it's leaving someplace, turning off the TV, getting away from somebody, turning off your phone, walking out of the office when you're tempted to blow up, walking away from an argument, ending a relationship. God always makes a way out. The problem is that we can't get away from it. The problem is that we don't. And let me throw this in. Let me throw this bonus here. We need to not only get out of situations where temptation arises, but we need to quit getting ourselves into situations where sin will arise. Let, let's just, there's the scripture, lead us not into temptation, but we also need to not lead ourselves there. Hello? Sometimes you and I are to blame for getting ourselves into tempting situations. That's why the Bible says, for, the Bible says, forgive us our trespasses. What's it called when you go somewhere you're not supposed to go? Trespassing. You know what sin is? It's when we trespass. We go past the boundaries that God has set up for us to live a blessed life. That's what sin is. Sin is beyond the healthy boundaries that God has set up for us to live a healthy life. Sin is just going beyond God's boundaries. God set this boundary and said, look, if you go beyond that as a human being, how I created you, that is going to hurt you over there. It might not hurt right now. It might feel good right now. But eventually what you do over there past the boundary line, when you trespass, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. And so God puts up a big signs and he says, the Bible says, no trespassing. And sometimes we march right in. When I was a kid, when I was a kid in Wisconsin, all out in the fields, the farmers had electric fences. What do we kids do? Ah! 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 Crazy, did you see that? Ah! Careful, don't touch it when we go in. When you see a no trespassing sign, don't just stand there and stare at it. Go the other way. Amen? Whoever watched Hee Haw? Whoever watched Hee Haw? Yeah? Hee Haw, funny, funniest show I watched when I was a kid. 
I, I, Roy Clark, I want to, I want to be Buck Owens, hey man. And uh, uh, Buck Owens, and, and the funniest, funniest guy. And in the show, there was this little old man called Doc. He probably wasn't even that old back when they did the show, but when you're a kid, he looked like he was like 800 years old. And, and uh, he always, he'd, he'd do this skit where he was the doctor and people would come to him with their maladies. And one time this, this guy comes in and Doc says, what can I do for you? And he says, Doc, I broke my arm in two places. And Doc says, then stay away from them places. <laughs> and let me add this too. Can I add something here? If you are giving into temptation in any area of your life, this is going to kick somebody in the pants, so just hold on. Hold on to your pants. Put a, put a washcloth in there, amen? If you're giving into temptation in area, any area of your life where you've just released it, that's just, that, that's just what we do, you are making sin the master in that area. And it will affect all the other areas. No, no, it's just over here. You made the devil the master in that area. Don't be like, well, I might be doing this, but I'm not doing that. Don't think it's okay to just let sin in over there. Because it will weaken your entire spiritual structure. God says, there's a scripture, he literally says, don't, don't, don't think I'm stupid. I know what you're doing. And help, let me help you with that. Amen? Romans 6.13 says, I told you I'd kick you in the pants right there. Amen? <laughs> Romans 6.13 says, says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as it is an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. Don't let sin have any part of your life. Don't give it an inch. Paul said in Ephesians 4.27, he says this, never give place to the devil. Place refers to, go to the next one, let me show you the word place is in the, in the, in the Greek. Place is opportunity, power, and occasion for acting. Look, I love it with my family, we all have dinner together, we sit down at the dinner table, but when we set the dinner table at night, and at least she sets the table now. She we put the plates out there, and at least puts all the plates on it. When we set the dinner table at night, we never set a place for the devil. The devil does not get a bedroom in our house. He doesn't get a seat in our car. If he gets in there, we stop and we say, "Devil, get out of the car." So why do we give a devil a place in our mind, in our hearts, in our body? Stop giving the devil, as they say, free space in your head. Amen. Don't give the devil an opportunity in your life. Two scriptures, Proverbs 4, 26 to 27, and then one more after this. Plan carefully what you do. Avoid evil. Avoid it. Avoid it. Avoid it. And walk straight ahead. Now let me throw in here that some things may tempt you that don't tempt me. And so there are some things that you need to avoid that I don't. That doesn't mean that we're not all tempted, but there are some things that I need to avoid that you don't. It says avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Just walk on by. Don't go one step off the right way. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.22, avoid every place evil might appear. Just quit going there, amen? Quit going there if you know something bad's going to happen. If you want to overcome temptation, you need to ask yourself three very important questions. Here they are. Take a picture of these, write them down, see them on the video later. Here's your temptation question. Number one, when am I most tempted? Learn that. Number two, where am I most tempted? Learn that. And number three, who is with me when I'm most tempted? Learn it. And then you have to make one of two decisions. Here's your two decisions. Here's your temptation decisions. Number one, remove yourself from those situations, relationships that are creating temptation. Number two, if you can't remove yourself from those situations, relationships, you need to invite God into those situations with you and ask him to help you learn to trust in his faithfulness and his power. Amen? When you are tempted, don't get drawn into its power. Look for a way out and take it. And then last, everybody say last. Last and very important for overcoming temptation. Number four is this. Hold yourself accountable. You know the best thing you can do 
and this will scare the socks off you. But get a godly Christian friend. Amen. Don't go tell somebody who's already doing what you're doing. No, go and, and, and isn't, isn't dealing with it and doesn't know God. Get a godly Christian friend and tell them where you are struggling with temptation. And ask them to not only pray for you, but to be there to encourage them when they need it. When you hide sin, oh, sin feels free. When you hide it, oh, I can do anything. Nobody sees me. Right? Nobody sees me. Well, watch this. Proverbs 28, 13. When you, if you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and then reject them, I reject you, sin, you will receive mercy from God. Isn't that awesome? Two more quick scriptures, James 5, 16. Let's go to the next one. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now listen, somebody you trust, a brother or sister in Christ, so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And then go ahead and click into the next one. Here it is. Ephesians 5.11. Do not participate in the unfruitful, yeah, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Instead, what's it say? Expose them. Get it all out in the light with a godly brother or sister in Christ. And oh, you, you even know what I mean right now. You're just thinking, if I could tell somebody, if somebody could do this with me, not just God, yes, God bears my burdens, but I need somebody else to lean on to bear this burden with me. It'll be easier. And let me say this, that one of the greatest decisions you can make is to learn this process and decide ahead of time what you're going to do when temptation comes. Friends, God knows you and I are human. He knows that, he knows, listen, he knows that none of us wakes up in the morning saying, wow, today I hope I am strongly tempted by all kinds of sins. <laughs> God knows you and I have a lot of oops, I did it again in our lives. And he knows we're going to have a lot more. But the goal is to trust him more every day and try to be a little bit more like Jesus every day and at least try to lessen the temptations every day. Include God in it with you. And, 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 and when you do it again, you don't get stuck in it and stuck in the shame, but you repent and you dust yourself off and you get back up and you keep on going. Friends, temptations might come upon you. But remember, during the entire process, God is faithful. God is faithful right in the middle of our temptations. And it says in 2 Peter 2 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. So lean on him and let him. He knows what to do. Even, even your most powerful temptations are no match. Hello? For your all powerful God. This is why every day you need to build your relationship with God and read his word and get it in your heart and come to church and be encouraged and equipped and be watchful and pray. Amen? Amen. Last scripture, last scripture. I read it already, Matthew 26, 41. Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing. For the spirit is willing. For the spirit is willing. How can we say that, that, that second part more? Don't trust in your body. But trust in the Spirit of God that lives in you. And you will overcome temptation. Master class for today. Let's give God praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Let's pray. God, we come to you in Jesus' name. And God, this is a master class because you are the master. And this is your word revealed so vividly and brightly, so beautifully illuminated, God, so that we can live it out, not based on just what I say, Father, but based on what you have said and what you are capable, are able, are willing and wanting to do in our hearts and lives and minds and spirits. And so, God, these incredible people, these, these are the most wonderful people I've ever known. Today, God, let me be honest, we don't, God, we don't mean to, we don't mean to sin. We don't mean to fall into temptation. We mess up. We make mistakes. And, and God, I, I know that all of our lives, we all feel that our lives would be just a lot more joyful. And, and we'd be living our purpose a lot fuller. God, if we, could, if we could learn to overcome temptation, 
if we learn to follow the plan that you've set out for us, we can overcome that temptation. And so God, today, I, I just want to say and pray this to him, if this is you, God, I want to learn what to do to temptation. And I want to learn it in a way that I know it, so that every time temptation comes, I am prepared to fall on my knees and pray, to trust you, and to rebuke and reject that sin, to get away from it. And Father, absolutely, absolutely, to know that you're with me and you're empowering me, God, and to know that I can make myself accountable to somebody else. And Father, help me to get over my inhibitions and find a real brother or sister in Christ, part of my village here that loves me, that I can go to them in confidentiality and I can say, hey, I need some help with this. So God, between me doing what you want and me trusting in what you do and me trusting in someone else to help me, God, I'm gonna, I want to overcome. I'm going to learn to overcome temptations so that I can focus on my purpose or getting to my purpose, or finding my purpose, or knowing my purpose, or living in my purpose. I don't want to be Eve who was so easily drawn away. So Father, today, any temptations I'm dealing with, and maybe you're dealing with them right now, today I, 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 I want to start over brand new. Maybe you've been really stuck in something and you want to get out of it right now. Maybe you've, you've kind of given yourself over a little bit to something. And today you want to say, God, today I stopped that thing. And I ask you to forgive me. I reject it. I rebuke it. I rebuke the devil in my life. I rebuke his power over me because uh, sin is not my master. God, you are my master. And I have mastery over my sin. So, Father, today I, I want to stand up against it. Today I stand up against the sin that is so easily besetting me. The sin that's been getting my focus off of you and my purpose living for you. Forgive me and bear that burden with me and take it off of me. And today I start over brand new, forgiven, set free, repentant. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. God, and I invite you into that situation with me, that temptation going moving forward. And when it comes, I've got you there with me, and I recognize that you're there with me, and you're faithful. And I'll pray, and I'll reject, and get away from it and be accountable. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me of all my sin. And thank you for your wonderful grace because I want to rise. Maybe you're here today and you've never, uh, maybe you've never actually <coughs> believed in Jesus or trusted in Jesus or asked him to forgive you of your sin. And you want to you find out God and all these healthy boundaries, not to bind you, but to free you because if you can stop going past those boundaries that God has made, it doesn't put you in a prison cell or you're locked up. No, it frees you really that those things won't draw you away from what your real purpose is. It's just drawing your mind away. That's all. If you want to believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus today as your Savior, the one who saved you from sin and death and hell. Just say right now, Jesus, I want to believe in you right now. I want to trust in you right now as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I repent. I don't want to live like the world. I want to live your way and be free from all the things the devil sends that have drawn me away from living for you and being free to live my great purpose in life. So thank you, Jesus. Please come move into my heart. Take over my life. Give me everything you have. All the blessings, all the promises, all the forgiveness. Heaven one day. Thank you, Jesus. And just take a minute. If you pray that right now sincerely, just stop and say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me of all the sins of my life. Everything, all the sins, past, present, future, they're all forgiven. Everything in your life is erased. All the sins are erased. And God says you are made brand new brand new in Jesus. What a wonderful, incredible gift. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. 
Never felt a love song. 